Hello, Booktube. Well, I come before you more snot than man. <laughs> the viral infection that I have has been in abeyance for a few days. It's been making my throat scratchy, but it hasn't been doing any more than that, out of a kind of gentleman's agreement to be nice to each other. Uh, and then last night I had a young friend over, and we had uh, heavy food in large amounts, and we had a lot of wine, and I had a wonderful time, and the virus inside me thought, well, if he's going to enjoy himself, then so am I. <laughs> As a result, today, the gloves are off, <laughs> and I, the, I feel consequently awful. <laughs> so this will be, we'll do a mail haul. But it will be a mail haul of the damned. <laughs> so uh, so we'll, we'll go through these, but I am sorry ahead of time for slurping, sneezing, that sort of thing. It's uh, it's largely unavoidable when the thing is... <laughs> and it, it doesn't help any that March's weather has decided to become sub-zero freezing with in unabating winds. And I learned this morning when I dared to look at the weather forecast, snow, lots of snow is, repeated snowstorms are in the offing for the coming week. I, <laughs> but anyway, the mail might cheer us up. Let's, let's see if it does. Uh, I'll do this first one. You want the mail, little bean? Mm -hmm. No jumping yet, but we, we might get that. She and I just went on a long walk around the neighborhood, and I was reminded yet again that I, once again, I thought I, for, for years on this street, I had my basset hound, Lucy. No one remembered my other dog, Malin, but Lucy was a star. Every single person on the street knew her. Everyone on the street adored her. Um, People would call out from their cars. School children called out from their buses. They called her by name. They didn't. They didn't care about me or me. <laughs> but she was a star. And I kind of thought when that when when she died, I kind of thought maybe okay, that's a little freakish. And now we'll go back to normal. But uh, my little Hanoverian warrior princess is a very popular dog on the street where I live. Everyone knows her. Everyone can't wait to see her. And. There, it's helped by her way of greeting people. She frantically greets people. She is enormously happy to see people. She doesn't really care much about dogs. She certainly doesn't care much about getting exercise or incoming weather. But people, oh, she yells and runs up to them to jump all over them and say hi to them and lick their hands. And uh, that's a very different thing than Lucy. Lucy sort of enveloped you like a fog. One minute you were looking at her in the distance, and the next minute, unbeknownst to you, she was suddenly all around you, and you couldn't get away from her. <laughs> she moved very slowly. Freed is a very different thing, but people love her. So, uh, so anyway, what have we got here? This is from Yale University Press. It's a February book, uh, and it's called Quest for Status, Chinese and Russian Foreign Policy, probably in the present day. Yeah, in the present day. Okay, so it's an, uh, an academic treatise on on uh, Russian and Chinese foreign policy. I, it's hard not to find that interesting if you're an American, uh, but I don't know what I'll do with the book. We, we shall see. Uh, but anyway, it, it need not detain us. We can move right on. You know. This one also feels heavy enough to be a finished copy. Finished copies are a bane of my existence now. Ah, okay, yes, this is another finished copy, and this is March. It comes out at the end of March. This is something we've seen here already. I can't wait. I haven't read it, uh, but I, I'm not, I haven't read all of it. I read a chunk of it. I was flying through a chunk of it, and I was really enjoying it. And then I got distracted by some other pretty shiny object, and I stopped. Uh, so now I'll be going at it. This is Vasily Grossman and the Russian and the Soviet Century by Alexander Popov. Uh, and this is uh, the story of the author of Life and Fate and also the author of Stalingrad, which we saw on this trail. I got the new New York Review of Books paperback of it just recently. Uh, and this is, the pub she is calling this the, his definitive biography. Uh, if Vasily Grossman's 1961 masterpiece, the novel Life and Fate, had been published during his lifetime, it would have reached the world alongside Pasternak's Dr. Zhivago and before Solzhenitsyn's Gulag. But Life and Fate was seized and banished inside KGB vaults. Decades later, when it emerged posthumously, its genius was quickly recognized. Figures such as Martin Amos dubbed Grossman the Tolstoy of the USSR, and critics viewed Life and Fate as a war and peace for the 20th century. I kind of sort of agree with all of that. 
ordinarily that would be the sort of thing we would consign to pub sheet hyperbole, but in this case it's, I think, probably true. Wow, so this is, I, I need to get to this, I really do. Uh, I will I will get to this this week. Uh, I've let this go way too long. Uh, Alright, let's see what this next one is. Yet again, a finished copy. This is... Oh, baby, you lost interest, have you? Alright, so what have we got here? Uh, okay. All right. All right. This will be um, <laughs> this will be a little bit okay. These are, these last two are hitting marks definitely. <laughs> this is also a late March release. Oh my. <laughs> okay. This is by David Dowling and it's called A Delicate Aggression: Savagery and Survival in the Iowa Writers Workshop. <laughs> Those of you who may not be familiar, the Iowa Writers Workshop is. Um, Probably the most prestigious workshop, writing workshop uh, in the country, if not the world, and uh, has had a great long list of famous degree holders. Uh, it's it's situated in beautiful Iowa City, <laughs> on the banks of the Iowa River, uh, and it's uh, it produces a certain kind of fiction. It, it produces you can. I have some literary friends, some uh, book review friends, who say that you can spot an Iowa story a mile away. Uh, maybe not necessarily in a bad way, although, you know, the the world of MFA, of writing programs, is full of folklore about, <laughs> about the pernicious effect that can be had on the students if the workshop has, for instance, a star, one star, like John Barth, or famously, or something like that, where the students start to imitate the, the master's manner, and it produces all sorts of grotesqueries. <laughs> well, I don't imagine this will be about that, though. Uh, as the world's preeminent creative writing program, the Iowa Writers' Workshop has produced an astonishing number of distinguished writers and poets since its establishment in 1936. Its alumni and faculty include 28 Pulitzer Prize winners, six U.S. Poet Laureates, and numerous National Book Award winners. This volume follows the program from its rise in the early 1940s under the directorship of Paul Engel, who promoted the workshop method of class peer criticism. Class peer criticism. Oh, God. Workshop sessions just one of the most infuriating things you could ever imagine going through. Uh, literally like like just you put your manuscript in the middle of a room at a zoo and just watch the monkeys fling their own offal at it. <laughs> uh, but the, they, they of course the pub sheet of course goes off uh, gives off a, an abbreviated roll call of those greats. Uh, Flannery O'Connor, Dylan Thomas, Kurt Vonnegut, Jane Smiley, Sandra Cisneros, T.C. Boyle, Marilyn Robinson. Uh, and this is going to be a history of the workshop. Okay, all right. There have been a couple of others, uh, but not, as far as I know, any from an academic press. Uh, okay, well, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't get an advanced copy of this, but I'm obviously not going to leave it unread. <laughs> so, so then, all right, we're we're doing just fine here. Uh, let's move on to some some cardboard here. Uh, also a finished copy. Ah, okay. All right. We this is this is March. My March shelf is just a joke. It's just just ridiculous. Uh, it's enough for an entire book section of a newspaper. You could just parcel them out among six or seven writers. I am not six or seven writers. <laughs> uh, this is the finished copy of Bruce Berger's uh, A Desert Harvest, New and Selected Essays, which we saw in the advanced copy here. One of the most prolific and astute chroniclers of the American Southwest. Uh, from its cacti and birds to its musical culture and small town politics. Uh, and that's that's what this is. This is a collection of those of those essays. And I have had the advanced copy. I don't God knows when we hauled that that advanced copy, and I haven't touched it. It comes out mid March. Well, I already knew. I already knew that uh, that March was just going to be in just a nonstop uh, onslaught of books, and that I'm going to have to double and triple how much I read. I'm willing to do that. <laughs> uh, all right, let's uh, let's go on here. such a blah feeling when you have a viral infection. <laughs> it's such a blah feeling. The blah feeling comes from spent bl white blood cells, and active and spent white blood cells that just start to fill your body and make you just sluggish. Uh, okay, all right. Uh, this is this is an April release, late April. It's going to be a big one. It'll get, of course, reviewed everywhere. It's the new Ian McEwen, Machines Like Me. I don't know that this will have... Uh, no, this is just an advanced copy. No mention of the uh, 
no no uh, picture of what the cover of the of the finished copy is actually quite striking. So it will jump out at you at your bookstore. Uh, but this is a, a story about uh, artificial intelligence. It's it's him playing around with that idea. Uh, it occurs in an alternative 1980s London. I can't imagine the 1980s London being any better in any alternative. Uh, Charlie, drifting through life and dodging full-time employment, is in love with Miranda, a bright student who lives with a terrible secret. When Charlie comes into money, he buys Adam, one of the first batch of synthetic humans. Uh, and it, it's Adam who's on the cover of the book. With Miranda's assistance, he co-designs Adam's personality. This near-perfect human is beautiful, strong, and clever. And, of course, a love triangle develops. And we're going to see more of these books. Right? Uh, we've seen a, a bunch of them so far. This is the first A-list talent to do it. But we're going to see more of these books because we are living. We, we, we look at cartoons like The Jetsons or, or uh, shows like Lost in Space and we think, okay, yeah, one of the staples of futuristic science fiction is that humans will live with robots as servants and as household keepers and whatnot. But we already do that. The fact that your, that your uh, Alexa or your Siri doesn't walk around seems to me to be largely immaterial. It's it's still a machine sentience in your home that you have just adopted. <laughs> and and you, you start to lean some weight on it. Uh, I, that's, I have been in many homes now in the last uh, three years. I have been in many homes where there, there is such an, uh, a, per, a thing in, I almost said person, where there is such a thing installed off in a corner of the living room. And the people in the home, adults, children, everybody, just routinely... They just routinely address the thing when they want to. They just pitch their voice in a certain way, say out the name of the device in order to get it to listen. But it's listening anyway, or it wouldn't hear its name. <laughs> and then just you launch off on what they want. So far, it's information rather than, you know, Alexa, get supper started. But uh, we're going to see more of these books because these writers, Ian McEwen, I guarantee you, has one of these things in his home. All right, so... Uh, so it'll be fascinating to see what he does with it. Ian McEwen is, as is, you know, he's one of our greatest living writers, but he does not always please me. Sometimes he bores the pants off me if I were, if I were healthy enough to wear pants. <laughs> At the moment, though, it's it's beyond me. <laughs> but, uh, but sometimes he's he's really good. I still, after all this time, can only chuckle at his his novel on Chesil Beach. I. I think when all, when all is said and done, when, I, when I'm looking back at my 28th year from a great distance in the future, and I look back on a lifetime of reading, I honestly think that even with all of the cheesy science fiction and fantasy that I read, that I've read in my life, all of the utterly ridiculous science fiction and fantasy that I've read in my life, I honestly do believe that when my reading career is over, On Chesil Beach will be the downright silliest book that I have ever read. <laughs> And that's saying something. <laughs> but, by the same token, <clears throat> I, like a lot of other people, thought that Atonement was a, an almost perfect work of beauty. So, And it varies like, back and forth like that. So I don't know, I don't know what machines like me will, will do. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, I will, of course, report back. Uh, anyway, let's move on here. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. This is a reprint. Uh, with a new preface by the author, and I don't remember ever having read this originally. Uh, I wonder when it when it came out originally. Is it going to tell me when it came out originally? 2013. Uh, this is a mathematician named Colin Task has decided to try the impossible. <laughs> He's to try to, decided to try not only to explain but to celebrate Isaac Newton's Principia Mathematica. This is the Magnificent Principia. The subtitle is Exploring Isaac Newton's Masterpiece. Got to admit, that is a terrific redesign cover. It's just a, uh, <clears throat> in terms of uh, popular mathematics, I, 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 read a, I read a chunk of this already, and it is certainly enthusiastically and smartly done. I just, the only reason that I'm seeming nonplussed is because I don't think that Colin Pass or anybody else has it in them to explain the, the, the Principia to me. <laughs> I don't think I, I don't think that can happen. And I don't know that there's room in my heart now. I am still obsessing about uh, that book on 99 proofs for a theorem. I, I still, I carry it with me everywhere. I study it on the toilet. <laughs> I'm just trying to understand it. And now I'm, uh, it, I've, it's got a rival. Uh, so what have we got here? Despite its dazzling reputation, Isaac Newton's Principia Mathematica, or simply the Principia, remains a mystery for many people. Uh, 
Few of even the most intellectually curious readers, including professional scientists and mathematicians, have actually looked in the Principia or appreciated its content. And this author wants to change that. So he, he takes readers through the Principia in this book. And this comes out, this, this uh, reprint with a new preface by the author comes out in mid-April. Uh, I'm certainly game. <laughs> I'm certainly game. I almost think there's some sort of... Uh, biochemical thing that must be at stake here because ordinarily when I when I turn my mind to a subject and try to understand it it gets closer to me it, it becomes clearer in focus but not not higher mathematics no, no they don't uh, but it, I'll, I will give it another try uh, <clears throat> so what is this next one finally we have an advanced copy oh no oh goodness gracious okay uh, all right this is due in late June, and it's from Da Capo Press, the great folks at Da Capo Press. This is by Adrian Gilbert, and it's Waffen SS, Hitler's Army at War. This could be a major release. This could be this could be a major thing. The first definitive single volume military history in over fifty years of the military force whose soldiers fought with ferocious determination, tough minded fervor, and passionate esprit de corps. During its short history, the elite military divisions of the Waffen-SS acquired a reputation for excellence, but their famous battlefield record of success was matched by their atrocities and systematic massacres against both soldiers and civilians. And Adam Gilbert here considers the distinct ideological nature of the Waffen-SS and its transformation as a military organization. Okay, I read... I've read three or four histories of the Waffen SS, uh, but I don't know. I honestly don't know when the last one was. It was quite uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what Adam Gilbert might have done. Uh, I, 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 uh, I don't know if there's even a bibliography in this advanced copy. Oh no, there is. There is a bibliography, uh, and it's fairly extensive. So I don't know what kind of research he did. He may. Uh, this may be just a narrative history from secondary sources, uh, but I'm. I'm now eager to read it. <laughs> I'm eager to read it. I will have to review it in open letters. Nobody will want a review of this. Unless I were to get an in at a military history magazine of some kind. I've often wanted to do that, but they seem like such a closed shop uh, that I I, uh, I tend to look at them and then just say, no, that they won't even respond if I try. So maybe I should try again. Uh, this is... I, I sincerely hope this is not an attempt to even to balance scales. The, the, the pub sheet seems... To put a stress on the military excellence and that that elan, that esprit de corps of, of the Waffen SS, and only mentions in a in a, a concluding sentence that that bit about atrocities, but they were actually known for that. That was it, that it, that should be first, not second. That in any in any encounter, in any any battle, in any field, uh, if the Waffen SS is there then you can guarantee, whether they're on the winning or the losing side, you can guarantee that that field or that battle or that encounter or that city will also be the site of an enormous civilian massacre. Uh, we, and we know about a lot of them. Well, there are a lot of them we probably don't know about. Uh, it, seemed, it was their signature, so I'd, I'd like it a little more prominent than the pub sheet, but we'll see how prominent it is in the book. Uh, this is going to come out until June, so I'm uh, as eager as I am. It's right up my alley. I don't think I'll get to it uh, right away. Uh, let's... Let's see here. I'm holding up. I'm holding up, just barely. <laughs> the problem, one of the problem, one of the problems is, is that when you get to be 28, little things, inconsequential things like a, a normal viral infection, suddenly become more important. They become bigger deals. Uh, okay, this is a March March release. Jeez, it's just never ending. Uh, this is, I think we saw the advanced copy of this. This is Tin Heart by Chauvin Ploza, with a, a cover that just screams, whatever. <laughs> Not sure I would have gone with that, but uh, uh, the, the pop sheet doesn't, doesn't oh, here we go. Uh, if you are still the same per, are you still the same person if you have someone else's heart? When a heart plan tra transplant gives Marlo Jensen a new lease on life, she embarks on a mission to find the answer to that question. Uh, I think we mentioned, we, we, we met, you remember we saw this before. Uh, she goes on a quest for the donor of her heart. Uh, and I guess finds that person, even though that would never happen. Uh, this, this comes out soon, the middle of March, and I have had the advanced copy all this time. Jeez. All right, well, 
these are just all reminders to me, very impatient reminders that I have to keep going. <laughs> Even on a sick day, <laughs> I have to keep going. I have to keep reading. Uh, this is the last one before I slurp off into the sunset. Although after this, after this package, I do have one more thing that came in the mail that is uh, better than any book. <laughs> so, uh, well, let's see what this is. Uh, <laughs> okay. All right. Well, you got to admit, this mail hall is definitely trying. <laughs> it's trying to get adopted by Steve. It is. It, we are hitting the Waffen SS, the the Iowa Writers Workshop. That we're we're hitting lots of Steve notes here, and we end on a Steve note. This comes out in May. Uh, it's by Rob Kugler, and it's called A Dog Named Beautiful. And it's the story of a marine, a dog, and a long road trip home. Uh, when U.S. Marine Rob Kugler returns from war and learns his beloved dog Bella has cancer, he hits the road with her for a trip of a lifetime, which has inspired thousands on social media. So this is I'll have to look that up. I'll have to look at that story. Now, with a dog named Beautiful, Kugler takes readers with him and his best girl as they embark on the road trip of a lifetime. Before he deployed to Iraq with his Marine Reserve unit, Kugler and his girlfriend decided that a puppy could be the perfect companion to keep her company until he was able to return. Okay, terrible, terrible idea. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. Uh, after seeing an ad in a local paper, they'd gone to visit a Nebraskan teen who was offering up Labrador puppies. Rob thought he was there to choose a dog, but she chose him first, running up and jumping on a fence to get a closer look, tail wagging. Rob met Bella, uh, and when he returned from the war, he had given up not only years of his life in service to his country, but he had lost a brother in the fighting as well. Grief-stricken, he found solace and relief in the one thing that never failed to put a smile on his face, Bella. <laughs> Exceptionally friendly and always with a smile on her face, Bella was the friend Rob needed. Uh, they would spend their days exploring nature and taking photos. And when she gets sick, he goes on a road trip with her. And this is, apparently, this has had a long life online. I'll have to find it and see what that is. And now it's a book. Um, and that that's fantastic. <laughs> so, so uh, I will, uh, that's fantastic. I will, this is May. I will get to that right away. I, and I will try not to, to lecture in my review. <laughs> but, uh, but just to stress one more time, they're not keepsakes. They're not toys. They're not photo albums. They're not uh, recorded messages. They're individual people. You're not getting them as a temporary stopgap. You're not getting them as a forget-me-not. They're, they're individual people with their own lives, their one and only life. <laughs> it's a staggering responsibility. You should take it on clear-eyed instead of what would happen if, God forbid, he had died overseas. What happens to the keepsake dog then? Uh, no, no, not as a keepsake, not as a trial run before children, not as anything else than themselves. <laughs> but I'm, I'm preaching the converted here, I think. But th that's all the books. Uh, I don't know that I'm strong enough to do a Steve Pyramid. Let's uh, let's give it a try. Uh, we have the Iowa Writers Workshop. Uh, we have uh, Desert Harvest, Essays by Bruce Berger. We have Vasily Grossman, his uh, new life of his. Quest for Status, uh, Chinese and Russian uh, foreign policy, and perhaps the mentioned in, in some of these chapters will be any mention of uh, the U.S. president that they happen to pick up cheap. <laughs> uh, Waffen SS, A New History of the Waffen SS, Magnificent Principia, a guide, a loving guide through uh, Newton's masterpiece, Machines Like Me, uh, the new Ian McEwen when it comes out, A Dog Named Beautiful, a uh, dog road trip, Tin Heart, uh, a novel about a heart transplant, Survivor, uh, and then we get to The Treat, which is not a book. It is instead a magazine. And it's not just a magazine, it's the greatest magazine of all time. Uh, it's National Geographic, which came to me wrapped for some reason. No idea why. Uh, a lot of times my issues don't. But what have we, uh, what have we got here? Oh, what a cover. Good lord. This is the cover. We are not alone. Look at that. Incredible. Oh, scientists say there must be other life in the universe. Here's how they're searching for it. Amazing. Okay. All right. So, so what have we got? 
in this issue. Uh, every it doesn't really matter because every issue of National Geographic is an, an astounding journey, just just an, ex an astounding exploration. But, uh, Uh, okay, there's a brief article on uh, water reflections in Venice, so we're off to a fine start. Uh, then, who's out there? Uh, the feature article on exoplanets and life on other planets. Uh, the, the magazine just matter-of-factly states that it's out there, that we are not alone, but we don't know that. Uh, statistically, it seems likely that we are not alone, but statistically it seems likely that we'd have had proof of that by now, uh, long since by now, uh, and it, that proof is singularly absent. Uh, what else have we got here? Gang Warfare in El Salvador, long article on gang warfare in El Salvador. You go to National Geographic for the heartfelt reporting, for the great uh, maps and charts, and also for the stunning photos. They, they, never, do, they never do anything without stunning photos. <sighs> The underground cave systems of Borneo. Oh my. Oh my. Wow. So you get people foolhardy enough to go down into those caves. Look at that. Look at that. Incredible. <clears throat> I mean, you get to give you a sense of the size. That's the person. That's a person right there. And there's another one. That's how big these things are. There's a whole a whole realm under 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 the surface of them. Yeesh. <sighs> I'm, uh, then a book on the mini monsters of the rainforest, <laughs> tree hoppers. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, fantastic. This is gonna. This gives you the mini monsters of the rainforest. Gives you a, a fold-out map of all of these creatures that live in the, the upper branches and the loam and everything that that are otherworldly. We never, only the specialists know anything about them. You're never going to meet them anywhere except there. You're going you're gonna to meet something like that. Uh, <clears throat> well, okay, so that is, that is National Geographic. We are not alone, which will be my reading uh, right away. It gets precedence over all of these. <laughs> In the meantime, I'm going to I'm going to clean up not only the floor, but also myself. <laughs> but I will, I will see you soon. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Thank you, Book Two.